get uh, a round of applause just for being here. That's nice. <laughs> uh, right, so I've been given the after dinner spot. Lucky me, when everyone's feeling nice and relaxed and slightly drowsy. Um, I've been trying to kind of take the temperature of the room this morning, trying to work out what kind of people are, are here, because this is the business day. And I see a few ties around and a couple of jackets, but there's also a lot of facial hair. So this is not this is not purely a business day, is it, going on here? There's, there's some there's some serious co junkies going on. I, I hope this this scratches where Rich is what I'm going to talk about. Um, yeah, we're, we're quite a different organisation from the folks you've had this morning, um, Oxfam. Um, so yeah, I hope it scratches where you're, where you're at. There we go. So this is what I'm going to try and um, talk about in the next 40 minutes. Um, hopefully this will uh, influence some of the, your thoughts about what Drupal can do when it's used to do some practical stuff. Um, so we're going to go on first of all to talk about how Oxfam, um, being an NGO, uses Drupal. What's so attractive to an NGO about Drupal? Uh, and then we'll, I'm going to explain to you some of the specifics um, of how we actually we, we use it practically. So we have a big intranet, um, about 10,000 people around the world use our intranet. Um, so you'll be able to understand a bit, a bit about how we use it. I'll give you a couple of kind of vague recipes of a few Drupal things that we use to make uh, the intranet work. Um, it's, you know, Oxfam communicates globally to an international audience, both internally to all our staff, make sure that they know what they're doing, why they're doing it, how they're doing it. Uh, but also to the general public, so how we communicate globally, uh, how we make the the sites, uh, the systems that we have, you know, how we tailor them to our specific um, needs. We constantly, you know, the organisation is changing, evolving, adapting. I don't know if you've been aware in the news this week, but we've uh, we just launched a new big campaign this week called Behind the Brands. Uh, this is. Um, what you're doing when you buy a bar of chocolate or a, or a can of fizzy drink, uh, whatever, you know, buying into the brand, you're also buying into the system that goes behind it. Um, we're launching things like this very, very frequently in, in Oxfam, and so um, you know, I'll give a couple of recipes again for how we go about delivering some of this stuff and, and how Drupal helps us. And then I'm going to kind of try and finish off with uh, the things that we love about Drupal, the things that it's brilliant at doing for us, but also some of the things that we find a challenge or the things that we're glad we know about now so that when we put, do stuff with it, we do it better. Um, very similar to what the, the, the last talk was about from Mr. Cap Gemini. Are you still here, Mr. Cap Gemini? I can't see you. No? He's gone. We're obviously not a big enough player for them. Okay, so... It's nice to know where you stand, isn't it? Uh, so... First of all, <laughs> I'm going to explain, hopefully, why, why NGOs generally use Drupal for good, talk about Oxfam in its specifics, what is Oxfam, many of you may know Oxfam um, from shops, um, many of you may not really know what Oxfam does, talk about our public-facing web stuff, our internal web stuff, uh, then I'll talk about how bits of Oxfam uh, around the world are using it, and then finally um, round up with actual practical uses for us. Just to explain, I am, this is me, Joe Baker, I, I'm a web developer for Oxfam International, um, and I'll explain why that's significant in just a minute. My boss is supposed to be here, she's called Carolyn Baker, no relation, I can't see Carolyn. If she turns up, should we all just turn and say, hello Carolyn, when she turns up? Oh, I can't see at the moment. Um, yes, that's me. So, Drupal for good. Um... Paul from MTV this morning mentioned uh, the Lullabots. Lullabot, uh, they're a Drupal agency based in the States, and Lullabot did amazing things around about Drupal four and a half um, to kind of push it forward as a, as a, a tool possible for organizations, for businesses, sorry, to use practically, rather than just a tool for hobbyists and, and small community sites. Um, and in 2007, Jeff Robbins, who's the CEO, I guess, CTO, I don't know which, what his role is, the big cheese anyway, at, at, uh, at Lullabot, put out an article talking about how Drupal can save the world. And this is a, a quote from the middle of it. With a concerted push, we could solve these problems, which he's already listed, and you can go on the site and see it. 
solve these problems once and for all and provide free, easy to, un user, easy to understand, user-friendly software to empower anyone, anywhere on the planet, to create the website that they need, to provide the communication that they need, to make their lives better. This is how Drupal will save the world, or take over the world. I'm not quite sure what Jeff's after there. But anyway, we in the NGO world absolutely love this, this kind of language. Having something that's free and easy to use. And this is, this is why we, we love Drupal. Uh, you've, you've probably already got the sense uh, from this morning's sessions that Drupal has a, an astounding sense of its community. It's, it's not just a piece of software, but it's a, you're, if you're accepting Drupal, you're accepting everything that comes with it. And one of, the, one of the great things is the community. The people who think about Drupal, who think about open source software, instantly start thinking about sharing. I mean, just having a brief conversation uh, over lunch with a few folk and saying, you come to places like this and you hear people talking about stuff that um, Mr. Cat Jim and I was talking about earlier on how to do Drupal at the very, very big scale, but it doesn't take too long to go around the Drupal community and you find actually there's people who are already doing it, who are willing to share their knowledge, share their experience, to give it out, and we love that about open source. I mean, in the NGO sector, that's what we do. We use our ability, our skills, and especially the cash that we can raise to do good in the world, and that's what the, um, the open source sector really does. And Drupal is especially good at it, I've found. Um, Drupal has definitely got a long history with non-profits. We at Oxfam were very motivated to take up Drupal because Amnesty International took it up. Um, and Amnesty's site has been, you know, has made a, 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 a big impression, I think, uh, at large. But there's lots and lots and lots of other NGOs uh, and third-party groups who, who, um, who use uh, Drupal. And we love that. And clearly the third point there, Drupal attracts astounding people, really great people who do want to make things better, they want to make their software better, but usually they want to make the software better because there's kind of an underlying philosophy that they're working with, they want to make the world a better place through software. So there's two um, links there on the bottom of the slide. Uh, there is a Drupal for Good group on groups.drupal.org, which is a place where so much of the community stuff for Drupal happens. But for quite a few years, there's also been um, uh, a Drupal for NGOs group meetup happening here in the UK. I think there's an equivalent in other countries and other continents. Um, but certainly that's been a really important um, part of NGOs using Drupal. Hi, Carolyn. <laughs> I told everyone you were coming, but you weren't here yet. Um, yes. So this is why we love Drupal. We love it for its community. We love it because it's free. Well, it, it costs no money to, to use it. It's not free free. Um, it's free as in beer. Someone's made the beer in the first place. Um, we love it because it's incredibly powerful, as you saw from Mr. Cap Jim and I first um, in the previous session. It can do incredible things, do huge sites at huge scale. It's astonishingly extensible. You download a core system, but the amount of modules you can add to extend it to your particular uses and the amount that those particular modules can be extended themselves is astounding. And if it doesn't exist, if it's not there already, well, it's pretty easy to build it, whatever tool it, it is that you want. It is pretty damn comprehensive. Pretty much everything you want to do with Drupal has been done already or, or being done, and you can get involved in the process of, of it um, happening. We love it because it's robust. It's certainly been proven, as you saw from some of the slides earlier on, if MTV are using it and serving all of their users, Man Alive has been proven, quite apart from people like the White House and um, Eurostar and uh, who else? Uh, IBM use it. If Big Blue use it, Man Alive, it must be it. And we find that frequently Drupal does do magic. So something about uh, NGOs, the NGO sector, and particularly um, Oxfam International. Of course, no NGO is like another NGO. Every, every single one is different. Every single one does its work in a different way. But there are lots of crossovers and lots of ways we think about the world that are similar. This is Oxfam. If you don't know us already, we are um, an organization who seek to make the world a better place, a world without poverty and a world with greater <coughs> justice. Um, there's kind of four main things we do. We work on um, emergency relief and humanitarian relief. Um, we do development projects um, when the emergencies aren't going on or after the emergencies have gone on. 
um, how to help people return their lives back to better than they were before. Um, we do big campaigns, we're a big campaigning organisation, uh, and much of that is about um, enabling uh, the general public to get involved, to understand the issues, um, to be equipped and enabled to uh, transform the world. And the fourth big thing we do also is, is advocacy. We try and uh, work to get local, national, transnational governments to um, change the way they do things to make the world a more just place. However, I think, uh, and certainly for me, before I started working in, uh, at Oxfam, I saw it as Oxfam. It's just a big organisation like Coca-Cola or um, Microsoft. It's one big organisation. But actually it's not. Oxfam is, in fact, 17 organisations. Um, these are they. The one that you UK residents will know is Oxfam Great Britain. And the reason why you'll know it is Oxfam rather than Oxfam Great Britain is because they got there first with using the name Oxfam. So look on their website, the logo they have is Oxfam, whereas all of the others use the name um, kind of as a, as a, uh, a sub-element uh, on the main logo. But actually there, yeah, there are these 17 national Oxfams. Um, most of these national Oxfams have become part of Oxfam because they were once previously uh, an independent organisation basically doing exactly the same thing in pretty much the same way. And it made just so much sense to work together. And so um, you'll notice two there have got a slightly odd name. The Spanish one on the top on the, on the right-hand column, Intamon Oxfam, was Intamon and is now part of Oxfam. Um, and they haven't dropped the Intamon part of their name. Maybe they will in the future, I don't know. Similar for uh, Oxfam in the Netherlands. Oxfam Novib, it's known there. Uh, Oxfam in France was, for quite a few years, Oxfam France Agir EC, for, for those kind of reasons. And it's only in the last year or so where they've dropped the Agir EC bit. So all of these organisations have kind of grown together, or many of them have grown together to form the one big Oxfam. That does mean that the, kind of some of the relics are free to determine their own destiny to a degree um, within the limits of kind of membership of the Oxfam family, Oxfam Confederation, but they are basically independent um, organisations. Then there's this one extra bit, and this is the bit that I work for, Oxfam International, and we exist to do a few things, but we're basically to try and get these Oxfams working as one Oxfam, talking with each other, coordinating with each other, um, making sure that when they publish stuff, it's not going to have ramifications for, for other people. For example, saying things about um, the Chinese government, which might cause problems for Oxfam Hong Kong, you know, for example. Um, and, we, and we do lots of other things. Uh, uh, one of the, the key things is that when we work in the field, responding to emergencies or doing development work, we may have an experienced practitioner from here in, say, water resources, an experienced practitioner here in disease, um, experienced practitioner in um, talking to the media uh, from different Oxhams. You bring them all together to make one coherent team. They can't say that's, a, that's someone from Canada, that's someone from New Zealand, that's someone from Mexico. You say, this is Oxham International. So that's one of the things that Oxham International does. One of the impacts on Oxham International is that the affiliates don't want us to stamp on their toes. Uh, affiliates is the term we use for the members of the, of the Confederation. Um, understandably, you know, they don't want us raising money in, um, let's say, the United States of America, just picking a random example uh, from the list, because, I mean, everybody else is exactly the same as Oxfam America. Um, <laughs> Uh, they don't want us to raise money in their domain. They want that to be something which they, can, um, they raise themselves. And so part of our constitution is that we, Oxfam International, aren't able to raise our own money. Um, we subs um, subsist on, um, uh, I think it's something like a 3% commitment from annual income from all of these affiliates towards um, our budget. And, uh, yeah, so... That's how Oxfam fits together. Now, because of this kind of spirit of independence, what you'll find looking at Oxfam science is actually slightly similar to, to MTV in that you'll find a bit of everything going on. Um, Plone was quite dominant for a few years. If you don't know Plone, it's a, it's a mega open source system, absolutely enormous, but unfortunately a rather small development community doesn't quite move as fast as other open source tools like 
Drupal and WordPress, for example. Oxo International used to be on Plone. I was brought in to work uh, with the organization when they moved from Plone to Drupal. Uh, Oxo America are still using Plone. Uh, WordPress is used in a couple of places. I think um, Oxfam Australia use that for their public site. I've got a feeling Oxfam Japan do as well. Um, there's one or two sites that do it just in straight PHP coding from scratch, which is impressive. Uh, Oxfam France, I think, use SPIP. Uh, Oxfam Novib in the Netherlands use this smart site experience. I've never heard of it before. Um, ASP.NET type thing, I think. Uh, Oxfam Great Britain. Um, which is the biggest part of Oxfam, has actually just migrated from doing it all by hand in HTML pages, can you believe that, pretty much, to using Sitecore and Telligent, which I don't, I don't know. But over the years uh, that I've been there, which is only five years, um, Drupal has become more widely adopted, partly, I think, because we at Oxfam International have done a pretty good job with it, um, partly because Drupal has had continuing uh, wider adoption in the NGO sector. So back to the little list, just to point you at um, how much of the organization is now using Drupal for their public websites. Oxfam Canada are, Germany, India, Spain, Ireland, New Zealand and Quebec. Uh, Oxfam France in italics because they're just about to move onto it. Uh, I met two, two lovely um, folk from France today. Um, one of whom is a developer, I can't see you, you're here somewhere. Ah, oh, there you are. Uh, one of um, whom is a developer who's just been started talking with France about um, a project that I'm working on at the moment, which is kind of exciting. Um, so yeah, almost half of the organisation is now using Drupal, which is, uh, which is brilliant from my, my point of view. However, we're kind of at a, uh, a slightly odd place in that uh, many of these... Um, Affiliates are using Drupal 6, most of them I think are using Drupal 6, and what with the old financial crisis and all, can't really afford to move to Drupal 7 just at the moment. Um, so they're, they're in a, a pretty difficult situation, especially I think Oxfam Spain, with you know, Spain's terrible uh, experience of the financial crisis. Um, they're particularly suffering. Um, there's also another complication, which is that uh, Oxfam globally is moving to a new brand, partly because we have this kind of spirit of independence. Um, the way the brand has been put into practice over the last uh, decade or so has been a bit random. One of my colleagues took a journey from Oxfam Spain back to his um, office in, in Holland and travelled through three or four different Oxfam domains to get there. Um, because he stopped off on the way to see people in Italy and um, through, Sp uh, through France, obviously, and was astonished at the huge variety of promotional literature that he picked up at various different places along the way. It'd be hard to believe, he said it to me, it'd be hard to believe this is the same organisation. So as a result of that, we are moving to this <coughs> new brand. We call it the Global Identity. Um, and these slides look particularly spiffing because they're in the Global Identity slide <laughs> um, uh, template that we have. Um, and that's, making, that's add, cr creating an added complication for these affiliates to move um, their website to the new um, theme as well. So that's, sorry, to the new brand. So we're using Drupal, but there are complications. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the public websites that we, use, uh, we have at Oxford International, how we use Drupal for them, a couple of quick recipes on, on interesting things we do. We have two main public websites, www.oxfam.org and blogs.oxfam.org. They look like this at the moment. Uh, that's the current or the old brand. And very soon, they'll look like this. Uh, it should have happened ages ago. It should have happened in July last year. <laughs> and then it should have happened in September. And then it was going to be November and then December. And then it was going to be early January. And we're... 1st of March, aren't we, today? So, um, yeah, don't hold your breath. <laughs> We're working very hard. We're doing a lot to try and get this site um, live. We're moving to the new brand. We're moving to Drupal 7. Uh, but also, the new brand requires a different way of communicating, a different way of um, talking about what we do. And so there's a huge amount of content, kind of reorganization, rewrite, and so on going, going on with our site. So we're trying to do a lot 
Um, but it should be live soon. Come on, please. It's taken ages. So the main site does these things. Obviously, it's the front door of the organisation. Uh, it's about the message of what we're trying to do. Um, so we talk hugely about the emergencies that we're responding to. Um, and our site comes under huge stress when there is a big one like um, the Haiti earthquake uh, or the uh, Asian tsunami. Um, so the stuff that um, Mr. Cat Joe and I talked about this morning, the high performance um, stuff is really important for our, our website in order to cope with these um, massive peaks we sometimes get. Um, and you just can't, obviously, can't predict when they're going to happen. It's about our mission, what we're trying to do in the field, um, to change the world, to help work towards um, eradicating poverty and uh, increasing justice. It's about change, and so it's about the campaigns, what we're campaigning on, how people can get involved in campaigning, how people can understand the issues for themselves and, and be equipped with tools to, to do stuff. And it's all about um, activism as well, getting involved and getting informed. Uh, the blog's website is is important to have a separate website, although we have battled with this, struggled whether it should be incorporated in the main site or kept as a separate site, but we have kept it as a separate site, really, because it, it just has a very different voice. It's a very different voice for the organisation. We communicate in a different way. We're much more conversational uh, on the blogs uh, that we write, much less corporate, much less um, we know all the answers. Um, at least I, I think we are. Um, so it's a different tone of voice, but also we try uh, uh, as much as possible to allow people who wouldn't normally be heard to have a voice. Um, so, for example, on um, World, Women Day, World Women's Day um, last year, we had I think it was eight people from eight different eight women from eight different countries um, who would never normally get heard um, blogging about their experiences and and uh, what they're doing or what we're doing with them. It's also a place where we really maximise our interaction with the social web. Um, so it's, the site acts as a kind of an, an aggregator of what Upsum is doing globally um, in the social web on Facebook, YouTube, Flickr, even Bebo and MySpace, I think we still do stuff on those. Um, we also have a, we have a little um, URL shortener, ops.am, using a Drupal tool built by Jeff Robbins, I think, originally, the man I mentioned earlier on, um, so that we can shorten all our, all our URLs um, for publishing in Twitter and, and the like. And, and that happens automatically on node creation, node update. Um, we shorten all the URLs automatically. And uh, just to highlight, in case you haven't picked up, we have three business languages that we use, three public languages, English, Spanish, and French. And so we publish uh, everything, well, pretty much everything, in, in all of those three languages. English is the primary. It tends to be that things are written in English and then get uh, translated into Spanish and French. But sometimes things come the other way, particularly if something's coming from um, Southern and Central America. Um, yeah, they may well come in, in Spanish first and then be translated. Uh, any of you who've got any experience with translation, it's a very complicated process, both offline and online. Um, we are fortunate that Drupal does support translation incredibly well. It does it in many different ways. There's lots of different ways to skin a cat, as it were. Um, and we're using most of them, I think, to try and get it done. So a couple of little uh, stories of things that we do to uh, with our Drupal inst installations. Um, as I mentioned, we've got these uh, different affiliates who want us to, um, yeah, to not stamp on their toes, to not stand in their domain. In fact, I think they would really rather we had nothing but a splash page on our website which pointed people directly at their websites, and that's all it, all it was. And we do have to argue our case quite frequently for existing, and, and uh, Carolyn, my boss, um, is very good at doing that. Um, there is a global audience for Oxfam, and so we do have a rightful place to exist. But one of the, the um, commitments we make to the affiliates is we try and signpost as much as possible. So we try and direct um, visitors to our sites towards um, the members' websites, the affiliates' websites, as, as frequently as we possibly can. 
to donate to find out more about campaigning going on in their area um, and uh, that sort of thing. Um, and also, we have to then respond to people who aren't within, say, North America or uh, in France or any of the affiliate countries uh, and give people from non-affiliate countries uh, an equally good um, experience on the site. So we detect people's IP, when obviously when they're on the, on the web page, we can detect them very easily. We translate to, that to a country code, and then from the country code, we can then work out what would be appropriate to display to the users. Uh, we do this uh, currently uh, on the existing sites, the old theme sites, by creating a whole different version of the, each page uh, for each country. So we have 18 different versions of each page uh, per language. Um, in our new site, we're doing that differently. We're using, uh, was it Paul you mentioned Edge Side Includes earlier on? Yes. So what we do is we cache the whole page and then we use this little wonderful tool in many caching tools called um, Edge Side Includes to inject tiny bits of the page in which are customized, adapted to a particular audience. So there's one cache for the page uh, per language and then inject in uh, elements into the page uh, which are needed. Um, to give the specifics for, for that audience. What this looks like in practice is like this. So on the new site you'll go to the home page and you'll see a donation um, link. Um, and that's what you'll see if you're in Britain, but if you're not in Britain, you'll see that. So if you're in an affiliate country, it'll be tailored to you. The link to Oxfam Britain, donate directly to Oxfam Britain, that takes to their donation page. Uh, and that, if you're not, that's to a much more generic donation page. So we use this kind of edge side includes and some custom codes, so IP detection. And we do this all over the place, not just with donations, but um, providing emergency response information, humanitarian response information, um, and uh, campaign information um, in each affiliate. It looks like this as well for our social media. So if you're in Britain, you'll see this in our, the footer of our site, where we're aggregating all the social media um, so the top one there is Oxford International's social media. This is social media from Great Britain, and this is a list of, of all the rest. You'll see that if you're an affiliate country, and you'll see that if you're not. Very simple IP detection. Second recipe of stuff we do. We had a very big campaign go live two years ago. The biggest campaign, I think it was two years ago. Biggest campaign we've ever done, maybe a year and a half. The thing that I mentioned um, behind the brands that we've done this week is actually part of this larger campaign. Uh, the campaign is called Grow. In f uh, uh, Spanish and French. And it uses those three tools you just saw, spaces, features and context, to make it happen. Uh, these are three kind of mega modules for Drupal. Um, we really like them. Um, because they allow us to create sort of micro sites within a main site. So that's one of the, um, the main things that we wanted for the Grow campaign. It needed to have its own identity, its own set of colors, its own template, um, particularly as it was advancing onto this new brand before uh, the main uh, organization or the rest of the organization was. And uh, so it needed to have its own look and feel within the site whilst kind of still retaining the architecture of the, of the, the rest of the site. Spaces allows us to do this. Spaces is a big module that essentially overrides the global variables, variables of the site for um, a particular area. So you can say within this space, if this space is active, then change the logo to be this, change the um, main language to be this, you know, change any of the variables you want to. And each space can have its own different set of variables. Um, it uses features. Features, again, is, a, is an incredibly powerful module for capturing kind of elements of the site, elements of how the site should work. Um, and then those elements can be turned on or, and turned off as a whole. So you can capture content types and um, uh, particular page layouts and lists of things. You can create blocks and all kinds of other elements and capture them all in one complete feature and then just turn them all on in one go or turn them all off in one go. But features is aware of spaces, and so, or spaces maybe is aware of features, so that um, the space can say, well, 
in this space, this feature is on, even though it's off in the rest of the site, because the space will override that setting. And then the third thing is to use a uh, context module, which context basically does stuff according to the context of the page. So it might change the design. Um, it might change um, or show or hide different blocks on the page, um, enable or disable various regions. It, it kind of reacts, it responds, allows the system to do stuff. And so these three work really, really well together. Uh, and we've employed it for the grow sort of area of the site. So a general campaign within the new Oxfam site will look like this, but the grow campaign looks different. Old, new. And that's what spaces, features, and context do for us. And then the third um, recipe I want to talk about with the public site is actually something which I'm working on at the moment. It's the, the thing I mentioned about uh, talking with Oxfam France about now. Um, develop a friend from France. Um, is that uh, our, um, as I mentioned, our affiliates are struggling for one reason or another to move to the new brand and to move to, new, to, to Drupal 7. And so I'm working at the moment actually, I'm making a base theme and starter kit. Paul, was it you who talked about that, MTV? Base theme and starter kit? Yes. Um, to enable the affiliates to be completely on brand, 100% uh, brand compliant when they use the base theme and then to take that base theme and kind of adapt it by using the starter kit, take everything which is the way in which we should be communicating style-wise, look, feel, um, layout, um, and then add on to it any particular elements which is specific to, the, to their context. Um, this is going to be a first for us, it's going to be a fully responsive design, which is what uh, Capgem and I are talking about. Um, but if I'm building this, it makes a lot of sense to build some of the features which provide the kind of underlying tools for the for the, the theme to work on. So, you know, everyone's going to want to have uh, an image gallery, um, some press releases, policy papers, um, you know, there's loads of features that you want to have on all kinds of sites. And then some which would be very specific to particular um, organizations. For example, Oxfam Germany, um, they have lots more shops than Oxfam France does, for example. So Oxfam Germany may want to have a feature which um, has a, a shop content type and a map and a, um, uh, a whole lot of stuff that goes with that. And I'm going to create this all together for them. I am creating this as we go uh, into a, a distribution with an installation pro profile so that as Oxfam uh, affiliates work with this, they can say, yes, I want that feature. No, I don't want that feature as they're installing it. Um, and be up and running with a, um, a, an empty, but nonetheless fully working Drupal 7 site pretty damn quickly. Uh, and the most exciting thing for us is we're doing this as a, actually as a collaborative project. So I'm talking with Oxfam Canada quite frequently, uh, Oxfam New Zealand, and Oxfam um, Ireland are interested in, in making this work with us. Oxfam Germany are eager to do it later in the year, and Oxfam France are eager to, to move on with it. So we're doing it as a big collaborative project. And in practice, it will look a bit like this for the theme. Every, everyone will be able to use the base theme. And then if they decide to work with a, uh, with a sub-theme, um, use the starter kit, they will take everything that's already in the base theme uh, and adapt it. The intranet. Uh, as long as I've been working at, at Onsite International, we've, we've had an intranet. Um, it was a flown one when I first started working there, and the plone intranet was really nothing much more than a place to dump stuff when you've forgotten about it. You would work on a Word document in a project group, and you get it completed, and you'd all send it around via email, and then think, oh, well, actually, we better keep it somewhere. I know, I'll dump it on the intranet, and then no one would ever refer to it again, pretty much. So it was, yeah, it was just a document repository, a big bucket to stuff stuff in. And then there was all the boring corporate stuff that you look at in great detail in induction week, and then never again after that. Uh, and then about three years ago, um, we were told that our intranet, as it was, would no longer be supported. Uh, it was Oxfam Great Britain who were helping us support it at that stage. And they said it wouldn't be supported anymore. So um, we had to stand on our own two feet, develop our own tool. 
so with some consultation, obviously, a lot of uh, talking discussion, some creativity and thought, uh, working with Carolyn and others, uh, I helped work towards creating a whole new intranet from the ground up built in Drupal, which is really cool. A lot of the um, initial work was outsourced to an agency in California, Chapter 3, uh, who were fantastic, except that they were in California. So we had one hour of the day when we could talk to each other, and they, if they got up very early, which Californians didn't seem to want to do, California coders didn't want to do anyway, and uh, very late in the afternoon for us before we all went home. Other than that, they were, they were fantastic. I really enjoyed working with them. And we ended up building something which is a big tool for collaborating. It's a big tool for which I think it kind of essentially mimics the way that people work in practice. It mimics what happens uh, when you're having a conversation over the coffee maker in the morning. Uh, it mimics the kind of uh, things that happen in lots of uh, business meetings. It's built around groups. There's groups for everything. We meet in groups in all kinds of different ways. Most of them are working groups. There's some project groups. There might be geographical groups, uh, interest groups, campaign groups in our case, uh, or just general interest groups. And so the whole system is based around the idea of groups. Groups can be created and, and, uh, and allowed to disappear, uh, kind of impromptu all over the place. Fortunately for us, Drupal has a fantastic organic groups module, as it's called, which supports all this, all this functionality. And so we, we built a system based on organic groups, which allow people to create and destroy groups um, at, at will, at whim. Uh, and as a result of this, um, we've been able to foster some incredible uh, collaboration, really. So each of these groups can have um, a huge degree of privacy. So we have three in ours, but it's, you are able to, you know, if you want to uh, create more, essentially groups can be open, so anyone can view anything that's in them, or the opposite, completely closed, so that only members, who are part, uh, members of that group can see what's in them, and then a kind of a hybrid in between. So it's basically closed, but some of it's open, some of it's available. Um, we can have subgroups, so you can have, um, let's say, um, an Oxfam Italy group, and then an Oxfam Italy campaigns group, an Oxfam Italy uh, humanitarian response group, an Oxfam Italy governance group, an Oxfam Italy web group, uh, and so you can essentially build intranets within an intranet. If um, is a, the, we've got all these privacy rules, you can control how uh, who can access um, this set of groups. And then we built into these groups um, the ability to have features enabled with them. It's not actually using the feature module that I talked about a minute ago, but it's essentially the same idea. Um, so that each group can say, I want to function in a particular way. I only need to be a place to stuff documents, or I need to be a place where people can discuss things. Uh, and so they have a whole host of features that uh, group owners, group managers can turn on uh, and turn off. Um, so this is our intranet. Uh, three interesting things about the intranet. First of all, we have a customizable home page. Many elements on the home page are personalized anyway, so you get your own contacts, your own diary, uh, your own recent content, uh, or recent content related to you from your groups. But you can also choose any extra content you might want to have on it using some drag and drop goodness uh, coming from panels. Um, so you can either have the default set or you can, uh, can create your own. So you see up here there's a customize this page link, customize the page, and all this wonderful stuff happens. You can drag and drop those around, add new panes into all these, these different areas. Um, you can have features for groups, as I mentioned, groups of different purposes. Um, so each group has a set of optional functions. Um, we have things like um, documents, discussion, calendar, newsletter, you can have tasks, uh, all of them can send notifications and it will look something like this so that when you're editing it you can choose which features you want to have on or off and it will affect the way that the menu for that group works. And then the uh, internet has built into it a recommendation engine and this gives us our real social element. So the system will recommend groups to you uh, based on things that you're doing already. If you happen to be working in a web group, 
for uh, Oxfam Germany, well, you might want to know there's a similar web group working on a similar project for Oxfam Japan. You might want to also recommend people to you, people who are working on similar things or doing similar stuff. So you can meet colleagues completely the other side of the world that you never met before, didn't even know existed, amongst the 10,000 other staff, um, and end up working with them, learning from them, sharing with them, um, and so on. And this essentially uses a shared taxonomy, which is one of the core modules in Drupal, it uses taxonomy, um, some shared terms that every group, person, every file, every entity essentially in the site gets uh, labelled with, and in a, if everything's shared, then you can connect things together. And so on the home page, for example, that'll look like this. These are things that have been recommended to me. I'll just briefly talk about what's happening elsewhere in Oxfam uh, with Drupal. As I mentioned, these are the, the Oxfams who are using Drupal. Now, I don't know a huge amount about what they do because we are all independent from each other. I have worked on the Oxfam Germany and the Oxfam India sites. Um, I built them originally, although they've been taken on since then from me quite a lot. But I know that they do lots of the similar stuff. They all have press releases and uh, image galleries, and they all do campaigns, and they all have policy papers, and <coughs> some of them have distinctives like Germany with their shops. Um, but I know that virtually all of them are connecting with external APIs of one kind or another for donations. They're connecting with external um, donation services and they all have to deal with um, different degrees of you know, security, um, uh, payment law, uh, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, some of them, I think um, Oxfam New Zealand, or I may be wrong, but I think Oxfam New Zealand are using some internal payment with Ubercart. And, um, but I think pretty much everybody else is, is, is doing, doing it externally. Most of them are, are integrating with some sort of CRM of one kind or another, um, and many of them are integrating with external campaign tools. But I can't really say any more than that, I'm afraid, on, on these Oxfams. So just some final thoughts, really, on working with Drupal. The things that we like about Drupal. We love that the software itself is free. And so it's easy to get in. It's easy to, to say, I want to build a new site. I want to build a new tool that does this. We love it that it's incredibly adaptable almost infinitely adaptable. It's really easy for me as the developer for Ox International to say, there's a module for that, or to be able to say, I know, I can build you a module for that. I love it that it's, or we love it, that it's really comprehensive, that it covers pretty much everything we want to do. It's very easy to say, uh, to, say to campaigners, yes, we can support you, uh, and get on and do it in double quick time. Um, it's really easy to use, well, certainly Drupal 7 is really easy to use through the user interface and it's getting much, much better. There's loads of tools being done to it. We love that there's an incredibly big user community and we love there's a great developer community and we love that they love talking, discussing and helping out. Um, we love that it's robust, we love that it's dependable and uh, we really, really like that it's got a strong permissions layer in it so we can devolve authority for publishing and managing content. About using Drupal, which I think are really important to take into account. It's not feature complete. When you get Drupal out of the box, you always gotta to work to customize it to your particular needs. That customization process is hard and it takes a long time, just like um, Kat Joe and I said earlier on. It's like any other big system. You have to do stuff to it. Because it is so customizable, yes, people can, can do huge amounts through the user interface, and that's absolutely brilliant, but it's really good to have easy access to someone who can help you tune it, whether that's a really good user interface um, user or a great developer, um, like MTV clearly have in Paul. Um, you need to think very hard about your hosting for it. If you're going to make it, if you're going to, especially if you're going to run a big site, you need to take into account many things about performance and scaling, um, good caching, um, and other performance tools. And as with any website, just because you launch it doesn't mean it's done. There's always more stuff to do. There's always more stuff. And that's great about Drupal. Um, it is so easy to do more stuff to it, but it's constantly, there is work to be done, there's bugs to, to be dealt with. And, and, uh, 
Yeah, so that's that's what we, we know now about working with Drupal. So, that's the end of my talk. I think that's just about... <laughs> We've got time for like a couple of questions and then we could go straight into the next presentation. But we got drinks at like half three apparently, so there is light at the end of the time. Uh, uh, at the back, I can't see you. Um, how did you get on with, with the internet and performance of um, authenticated users? Was that, was so that I can't quite hear you. Sorry, with the, with the internet site, oh, how, yes. did you, how did you get on with the performance of authenticated users? Ah, yes, that old chestnuts. Okay, Drupal's brilliant at caching for people who are not logged in, but it's not very good for caching when people are logged in. It doesn't do it very well. Yeah, we, we scratched our heads and, and thought really hard about how we're going to do this, and uh, come to my talk tomorrow on Vagrant, and you'll find out some of the tips and tricks that we, we employed, but basically we put massive servers in. Essentially, <laughs> it's not it's not quite that simple. Actually, what we did is we designed the system so that it can scale up very quickly. So it's um, the internet sits in the cloud. It sits on Amazon's EC2 hosting. Um, the systems are built with a um, provisioning tool called Puppet, um, which I can talk about in the break if you want to talk about it. Uh, but Puppet is a way essentially of describing how the server should work and where it should get all its stuff from to make the server work. We describe our servers very, very accurately in a very detailed way in Puppet. And so then if we have something like a Haiti earthquake and all the staff need to go on to get all the policies and procedures for responding to a big emergency like that, and the thing gets hit very hard with a lot of use, then almost instantly we can scale up the number of servers so we have lots of front ends or lots of back ends that can come in if we need them and then scale it back down. So that's essentially how we did it. We handled it with lots of big servers.